Okay, so um, good good afternoon, good evening, um, everybody. Welcome to um, this um, uh, international workshop um, related to the inscriptions of Libya, which is a joint event hosted by the Society for Libyan Studies and the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of London. Um, we have, um, as you will see on the slide, as I share um, as I share the screen here. Um, as you'll see on the slide, there's um, quite a large number of speakers here. Um, uh, I'm Gabriel Bedar at the Institute of Classical Studies. Um, the presenters then in, um, in order, I think, of presentation um, will include Charlotte Rouchet, Alessandro Jovenko, Catherine Dobbins Dalou, um, Charlotte again, Francesca Bigi, Catherine again, and Caroline Barron, um, who will probably all briefly introduce themselves in their full titles and, um, and institutions and so forth um, just when they start. Um, just to be um, on the side. side. Um, um, sorry, I wonder what that small, please move this window away, uh, message in the middle of my screen is for, but um, uh, that's that. It's going away, that's it's fine. Um, so um, the, um, the goal of this workshop is to, um, is to get through the short presentations as quickly as possible because what we want is to hear from you, the audience. We want questions, we want discussion, we want ideas and responses to that. So um, we, um, we, we've, we've scheduled an hour and a half in total and we'll try to, um, we'll try to get to the discussion part as, as quickly as possible. Um, if you have questions, um, please feel free to leave those questions in chat throughout the session and we'll come to them at the end we'll spot them and we'll we'll, we'll respond to them then um, if you wanted to join the discussion at the end please um, you can again either leave a question in chat or leave a note in chat saying i have a question um, or you can raise your hand in the in the zoom mechanism um, and we'll also spot you then and invite you um, to to unmute and um, and speak but please please remain muted um, throughout otherwise this session is being recorded um, and we um, we hope to upload it to YouTube later. So just as a, as a word of warning, um, if you do um, turn on your camera and unmute your microphone and speak, you are um, implicitly giving us permission to to upload that to to YouTube along with the rest of the video at the end. So just as a word of warning, if you prefer not to appear on camera and 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 so forth on YouTube, then any questions you want to ask, leave them in chat so we can read them out instead. I think that's all I need to say by way of um, by way of uh, preamble. Um, so I'll hand over to Charlotte to to introduce the um, the workshop. Unmute. Um, th th here's the list of all the things we want to talk about. Um, it. I want next, please. I want to go to where this begins uh, with Joyce Reynolds who recently celebrated her 103rd birthday and who started the uh, collecting inscriptions in Libya uh, immediately after the end of the Second World War and published very promptly uh, a volume of a thousand texts in 1952. Next, please. She one of the features of that publication was that it was quite sparse, it had quite serious and limited because it had no photographs. Later on, or virtually no, very few photographs. Later on, she worked in Turkey and I was lucky enough to work with her and we collected an enormous amount of material at Aphrodisias. Our challenge was how to publish the enormous amount of Photogra photography that we had. And so in about 2000, Joyce gave us permission to explore the digital. She doesn't love it, but she could see it was the future. Next, please. So in 2007, Gabby and I worked together uh, to publish Joyce's collection of the inscriptions from Aphrodisias. And that's how we come in. Gabby, over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, 
Yeah, so um, I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the sort of technical background to this, um, just to sort of get that bit out of the way. Um, but also in, in the process, um, a little bit about the experience of doing this quite technical work of doing epigraphy in a digital um, environment. Um, in, in the context of collaborating with Joyce, who, um, who actually was a very, very good digital epigrapher, um, but she hated the idea when Charlotte said doesn't love, that was a euphemism. She, she, she utterly, utterly um, loathed the digitality of what we were doing, although she was actually very good at it. She got the point um, and, um, and all the things that digital requires, precision, um, you know, attention to detail and so forth, were all things she was naturally very, very good at, it is, um, but, but the idea of doing this on the computer screen was 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 quite um, quite alarming to her. Um, but so 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 um, part of um, what we were able to do was made possible by the um, the existence of this set of standards for digital epigraphy called Epidoc, which um, some of you may have may have come across. I'm not going to read out everything on, on this slide, but this is some of the background to what Epidoc is. The point um, of, of what I'm making um, on this slide is that Epidoc wasn't um, creating a completely new way of doing epigraphy. It was using existing standards, so Leiden conventions, um, existing standards for digitization of literary and linguistic data and so forth, um, and, and simply bringing them together in a way to, um, to do epigraphy the way we've always done epigraphy, but to do it in a digital environment. And um, this led to, as, as Charlotte said, first the um, Aphrodisius and Late Antiquity publication in 2004, and then Inscriptions of Aphrodisius in 2007. Um, and this, um, this, this project really was a project that, in addition to being the result of working with these digital tools, um, is the project that more than any other um, in the history of digital epigraphy, really drove the, the standards forward. So with a dozen workshops over the course of four years, and we had all sorts of um, meetings and discussions and, and really got Epidoc so that it was um, really capable of recording exactly what epigraphers and people in adjacent disciplines like papyrologists, prosopographers, um, numismatists, etc., wanted to be able to record in these, um, in these digital forms. Two other projects that, that deserve an honourable mention because they were also involved in this discussion with the Vinadana, the tablets, um, and the, um, the uh, US Epigraphy project, um, both of which um, were also um, built using, using Epigraphy and took part in that early discussion. And then a lot more was taken forward um, by this um, Pirated Info project that, that led to this, um, the, uh, the putting online of the Duke Data Bank of Documentary uh, Papyri. Um, and this project, again, I'm not going to read everything on this slide, but the point of this project really was that for the first time they proved that it was not just something that you could use to um, artisanally, if you like, you know, spend hours and hours on each inscription digitizing in great detail, but you could also take existing huge data sets there were there were something like ninety thousand records in the various databases that made it made up the um, the uh, info site um, that already existed in other formats and moving those into Epidoc so that all the tools and all the, the the workflows that already existed for working with inscriptions online could be used to to deliver um, and and search and edit and work with um, these papyri as well. Likewise, the Igor Europeana network um, was um, was involved in. Um, taking things forward a few years later and again here's a few a few more things they did and a lot of this was again about converting from one data set to, to, to another format from databases to epidoc and vice versa um, and also working with all these existing um, very large tools like the wikimedia um, set of tools which are the the, the the basic tooling behind wikipedia and the, the related projects um, which is much, much bigger than, than, than epigraphy, um, but, 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 you know, epigraphy is, is an essential part, small, um, relatively speaking, part of that, um, of that vast, um, uh, you know, global network of knowledge that, um, that, these, um, that, that all of us are trying to, to, to create, right? Um, and so the, the, the really interesting thing about, about working with, um, with Joyce with this was that whenever um, I would say to her, I, I used to do for the purposes of the inscriptions of project, I spent about four years going to Cambridge twice a week and spending a day sat in the 
um, in the classics library with her, you know, doing a bigger thing. And whenever I pulled up a computer screen and I said, you know, how are we going to search for this? And what does this look like on screen? And how are we going to present this in a digital form? Um, she, she sort of got grouchy and didn't want, you know, didn't want to think about the computational side of it. But when I asked her the epigraphic questions that I needed in order to encode these things digitally, she immediately had a very digital answer to the question. Um, so really, the, 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 the point is, it, it became very clear that the kind of questions we ask in Epidoc um, are, to a very large degree, the result of the way Joyce thinks about inscriptions and about epigraphy. Um, but, but also, um, I really just want to make the case that when we're doing digital epigraphy with Epidoc, we're doing exactly what a very traditional epigrapher like Joyce um, does anyway. You know, thinking cl closely and carefully about individual inscriptions and also about large corporate inscriptions um, and all of the various different supporting data, metadata, images, archival materials and so forth that, um, that are required to, to make a, a full um, epigraphic edition. Um, so I think, I think on that note, I want to hand over to Alessandro. Thank you so much, Gabby, for your presentation and uh, my name is Alessandra Jovenko. I work for the British School at Rome and for the people who do not know the British School at Rome, the BSR is a British research institute for the humanities centered on the study of Italy and Italian culture from the Iron Age to the present day and on the practice of the fine arts and architecture founded in 1901 and based in the Valle Giulia in Rome. Um, it's been an honor to collaborate with uh, the London team, Charlotte Boucher, Caroline Baron, and all the people that you are meeting uh, here today. Um, over the course of the uh, activity of the BSR, various collections were deposited, donated, or have found a place among the unique holdings preserved in the library and archive. One of these is undoubtedly the inscriptions or Roma Tripolitania photo collection. And I'll talk about uh, this collection in more detail uh, in a few minutes. Uh, Prossima, please. Um, the long-standing collaboration between the BSR and the Society for Libyan Studies was uh, nurtured in the years soon after the end of the Second World War by the professional and academic relationships of notable scholars, such as Joyce Reynolds, Richard Goodchild, John Bryan Wolf Perkins, and Owen Brogan. With increasing definition and adoption of standards ad hoc to support the digital edition of texts, and Gabby has given us an example, the time was right to start an international project. In 2009, the BSR was invited to make a contribution to the publication of the first digital edition of IRT, IRT 2009, by providing the photographs accompanying the pioneering 1952 volume and hitherto only accessible in person at the BSR. We then shared with the London team the images digitized from the IRT cards. This project, started in 2009, has paved the way for other collaborations about which you will hear from Francesca Bigi in her presentation. Prossimo, please. Essential to facilitate the next developments in the presentation of the IRT photo collection has been the Heritage Gazetteer of Libya, published in 2015, and which constitutes a wonderfully authoritative file for georeferencing the sites, buildings, monuments, and descriptions of Libya. The BSR holds thousands of images relating to Libya, photographs taken or collected by John Bryan Wolf Perkins over the course of his research in Libya from 1940s to approximately 1970s, and which coincided with his directorship at the BSR. The Gazetteer has proven to be an additional source of information alongside the other more common thesauri or controlled vocabularies we adopted for the cataloging of our collections. Next, please. 
thanks to a grant from the British Academy and the continuous encouragement of Professor Charlotte Boucher, in 2021, we were able to work on the cataloging of this outstanding series and add metadata that link up to both the second digital edition of IRT, IRT 2021, and the heritage of Lydia Gazetteer. The first set of the IRT collection has just been published on the BSR Digital Collections platform, and we invite you to have a look at it and give us your feedback. Prossima. The IRT series is made up of nearly 1,200 photographic silver gelatin prints glued onto 284 cards. These are the materials that were accompanying the 1952 publication. These photographs are arranged according to the numbers assigned to each inscription in the 1952 publication. By publishing this collection, our aim was not only to provide access to the individual photographs, but also to frame them within their original context, namely the cards, which were accurately prepared to illustrate the 1952 volume. Next, please. And in this slide, you can see the association, which is very clear, between the photographs and the cards. Uh, Prossima. Uh, more significant, though, is the possibility of enriching the metadata of your records, in this case, our records, through linking them up to other resources and enhancing their exposure on the web. Our platform is not yet compliant with a linked open data framework, but what really matters here and uh, we were also advised uh, by Professor Charles Rouchet in this regard, is that these data are embedded into each record and can be manipulated later if you want to migrate the entire collection or part of the collection. So this is very important because in this way, we are creating the, we are preparing the ground, we have prepared the ground for more collaboration that we wish to continue in the future with these institutions and other institutions. Um, next, please. I think I've complete, finished my presentation, so all the questions I may answer maybe at the end. Now, I think uh, it's my turn. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I want to speak about this uh, scholarly program with international collaboration, which is IGCR and GVSTR. Next, please. The inscriptions uh, of ancient Cyrenaica had been collected since the 19th century from copies taken by travelers to discoveries of the 20th century excavations. The publications were scattered in a lot of publications, just here to remember the very old corpus. Um, and they demanded a stricter and more homogeneous study, taking also into consideration a good quantity of unpublished inscriptions. <clears throat> Joyce Reynolds had begun to study inscriptions in the years 1950. Uh, uh, Here she is photographed at Tokra. I began working in Libya with André Laronde of the French mission in 1976. It was agreed already in 1980 that the task would be divided between Joyce Reynolds for the Roman period and the French team for the Greek period. And we worked for many years with that aim. Next, it took us a lot of time to come to an achievement. And this was only made possible with the new technologies leading to an online publication. The first stimulus came from Charlotte Rocher and uh, Gabriel Baudard, who proved the efficiency of the method with their, their inscriptions of aphrodisias in 
27 and with the new edition of the uh, IRT in uh, 29. They provided the know-how and uh, uh, it was very useful for us. As for the Greek period, work began on that line in 2011 under the aegis of the University of Bologna. And it was decided in 2012 that the adverse inscriptions of all periods would be published together, whence this double collection, IGC, inscription of Greek Cyrenaica, and GDC, Greek verse inscriptions of Cyrenaica, with front page and translations of the inscriptions in four languages, as you see, Italian, Arabic, French, and English. Uh, not in that order, of course, English is prominent. Next is, as shown by the front page, many people from the three countries were involved. You have uh, in collaboration with so-and-so and, -so and with help of so-and-so, and further names are to be read in the credits and in the inner legends. That's for the collaboration. Next, please. The main fields in which collaboration was a decisive factor, uh, I, I'll show them in, in two parts. From uh, the UK, we got George Reynolds copies and readings of inscriptions that I did not see, or, although I studied a lot, the, there were some that escaped me. And also for some that I had seen too, but having a second uh, study was very useful. Second, of course, good working with uh, shared digital tools, thanks to Gabriel Boda's Epidoc and FS. Models of files that we aimed at keeping as similar as possible between the two projects, uh, because our publication was a little sooner in 2017 than uh, IRC, only because we had not so many inscriptions as for the Roman period. We have we have had also uh, about images. We took advantage of images from the RRC project, photographs made by Roger Reynolds and also by Hafid Walda, when mine were defective or non-existent, and also referring for all places to the Heritage, Heritage Gazetteer of Libya. Next, please. We shared also, of course, the mart with Italy. A first catalog was prepared in Macerata, listing all the inscriptions that we will have to treat. We got drawings and photographs provided from, by uh, the, our colleagues in Macerata from Gasperini's and Pachi Archive. We had main, the main part was Ali Chibenciben and her students who worked on shared files, added translations, reread the whole and amended a lot. And last but not least, the website is hosted in Alma Mater Studiorum in Bologna through the, the med, multimedia center of that university. <laughs> Next, please. Just as an example for the international work about the translations, I prepared French translations with Hugues Berthelot in Paris. And we also uh, prepared uh, English translations, but Ali Ben Chiveni checked them with her uh, students. She added the Italian translation and had a uh, a small uh, group of students, the Lab Unibo, which was also very active for that work. And Muna Abdelhamed, who is now on screen and, and last in Leicester, um, prepared some Arabic translations for that uh, edition. And she is still preparing further, further ones. Next, please. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So um, Katrine's work and ours was interwoven, as, you, as you've heard. For us, we had Joyce's material collected over about 50 years, um, of which about half had never been published, which is a, a larger proportion. And we had an enormous collection of photographs. The first step was simply getting all that stuff into digital form. And there we were helped by funding from the Leverhulme Trust get, and sorting through the images. Um, the next, next please. The challenge was then, how are we, what are we going actually to do with all these Epidoc files? Things had moved on and the, the transforming moment was when FS, a publishing tool of which Gabriel Boddard is really the originator. He's the person who thought of it and designed it with, like everything else, a team. In 2017, FS became available and it allows the editor, while we are working, to see what you're doing, to see what the final version will look like as you go along. Now, neither Gabby or I are experts on Saranaika. We're, we may be experts on Joyce, but we're not experts on Saranaika. And we had responsibility for all this material. Um, but what was so useful was that because we could create the draft version of the site, we could then share that, which we were able to share principally with Katrine, with her profound knowledge of Saranaika. We drew on some of her photographs, but above all, we drew on her knowledge. And it's a wonderful way to supplement your own ignorance. It's incredibly helpful to be able to share your work in this particular way. Uh, we were also, rather as with Aphrodisias, FS was still in the business of developing and becoming a useful tool. We were able to contribute to that. And using FS, the key person was Irene Vayonakis, who is also in Bologna, that key place, um, and gave us, uh, gave me in particular, uh, a great deal of guidance. And once we'd finished that, uh, which we managed to get out um, in 2020, uh, the, we had to think about, well, we, we had the wind in our sails and we also had, because of the pandemic, a lot of time on our hands. So next slide, please. We decided that we should go back to IRT. The publication that we had was not in FS, it was in a, a pre-FS form, uh, but all the materials were in Epidoc. But of course, it only recorded inscriptions found until 1955. There was a slight addition to 1952. What made it was that huge amounts of material had been uh, put into the Epigraphische Datenbank Heidelberg, where they were in Epidoc and where they had been reviewed by Francesca, who you're about to hear from. And the Bujam Ostraka were also in Epidoc in papari.info. So we were able with quite quickly to bring a lot of material together which was living in its own context perfectly reasonably, but could also be refigured in this particular context of these are inscriptions from Tripolitania. So the idea of reuse of material within different contexts for different to deliver different values is a very, very important one. The other thing was that here again, we were profoundly ignorant. But uh, the FS structure uh, what enabled us, again, with Irene's help, to share a pilot site. This time we created a pilot site and put it on an independent server and gave access to colleagues elsewhere who knew more than us 
and they're listed on the website, but they were people were so helpful and so generous that what they produced was so much more valuable than anything we could have done on our own. Um, and it's been marvelous to work with colleagues in this way. And I will pass on to one of those colleagues, Francesca. Unmute, mute, 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 mute. I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Hello, I'm Francesca. In my early days, I, I was lucky enough to work in Libya. Now I'm presently working for the Superintendenza di Roma. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity of presenting IoT 2021 which uh, we decided should be presented not so much for its tools or new characteristics, but as you've heard already so far, uh, to show how this was the result of a collaboration between institutions, but especially between people. Next, please, Gabriel. Because the whole of the IoT history is a history of collaboration. It started exactly 70 years ago with the first paper publication of 1952, which, as the frontispiece tells us, was in itself a collaborative enterprise because knowledge previously held by the Italians was passed on to and shared with the British scholars who took over the Department of Antiquities during the years of the British administration of Libya. Next, please. Uh, skipping half a century, a new chapter began in 2001, when I was a young archaeologist studying Libyan architectural decoration, and Ignazio Tantillo, a professor of Roman history, set foot in Lepchis for the first time to study just one or two late antique inscriptions. Uh, Ignazio immediately fell in love with the inscriptions of Lepchis Magna, realized how rich the material was, and that all the inscriptions had been engraved on previously used supports. And he soon realized that if he was only to give an account of the text, he would give only a very uh, incomplete picture. Whereas if we merged our competencies, I'm an archeologist, I'm not an epigraphist, we could actually give a much fuller account of the inscriptions. Next, please. Um, next slide, please, thank you. And so the result was, 10 years after, uh, a bulky 600 and odd pages book on 95 late antique texts from Lepchis Mania, which were set within their historic, topographic, stylistic and economic background. Uh, and I can really say that it was the joint effort uh, of 10 different authors who tried to look at the same thing from different perspectives. Uh, thank you, please. Very nice. The book, in turn, gave way to a new series of collaboration. First, in 2012, came the last Statues of Antiquity, which, of course, needs no presentation here, um, but uh, which meant not only contributing with the lectures and evidence to the project, but it meant, in the first place, sharing, discussing, and comparing material. The exchanges we had with the whole of the team, John Brian Perkins, Carlos Machado, Ulrich Gay, and Bert Smith, Julia Lennigan, and of course, Charles Brochet, who are Afrodisias, uh, it turned out to be a really uh, immensely instructive experience. Uh, next, please. And then came the Eagle Project, which again, it's good to remember that it was in itself another collaboration between more than 10 institutions. Uh, for myself, it meant working together with Alessandria, Alessandra, who you just heard, and the whole of the British School at Rome team on the translation into Italian on the uh, Tripolitanian text. And uh, I owe this collaboration to Silvia Orlandi. Um, while being involved in the Eagle project, we also decided to have a Heidelberg break, next week, please, and to update the IRT records which were hosted within the EDH, the Epigraphic Data, Data Bank of Heidelberg. And Heidelberg again turned out to be another wonderful environment because working in the very nerve center of such a complex database, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, 
epigraphic database. Under the guide of Francisca Ferraudi Grené and Brigitte Greff, who were responsible for the ADH, uh, uh, with whom I shared very profitous coffee breaks as well, it was again an enormous enrichment for, for all of us. Uh, next, please. Lastly, in 2016, I was again in Heidelberg, invited by Christian Witschel to create within the MTK, which is Material Text Culture Project, uh, to create a GIS-based interactive map of the late inscriptions of Lepchis Mania as a means to show the spatial distribution of inscriptions on a single stone and their spatial distribution within the cityscape. Uh, thank you. The, the next one. Uh, all these projects revolved around the same Tripolitanian inscriptions, and that is actually the proof that the same material lends itself to a multitude of uses. One study might focus on the textual content, one on the physical evidence, one study might set the inscriptions in the local context, whereas another in, in an empire-wide perspective. And just like there is not one way of studying the same inscription, there is certainly not only one way of publishing them. And a bit of each of these projects went into IRT 2021. But what I've told is only my side of the story. Obviously, the story is much, much longer. And so is the list of contributors, collaborations, and institutions involved. And uh, I really must say it, it's, it was only Charlotte's ability and vision that I think brought it all together. Thank you very much. Well, I'll respond to that then and just say, in order to launch Caroline and Katrine, we've been set a standard of collaboration, which was set by, next please, Joyce Reynolds, as I say, who has recently um, uh, celebrated her 103rd birthday. And I must say that it is very useful when you're having to argue with your slightly more conservative colleagues who say that they're too old for this kind of thing. And the important point that Gabby made, it's the intellectual and academic value that's important. And the digital provides an exceptionally good way of conveying those values. But directly you publish something online, people immediately ask, what are you going to do next? So I will turn over to Katrin, who has an answer. Yes, about what next? I, I want to speak about two, uh, two works on progress. First, after the 2017 publication of Ayrancia Gevitia, we have been aware of some errors. We discovered that a few texts had escaped the division between Greek and Roman periods. Some new texts were discovered and published, as well as some new important new insights. So five years later, thanks to that wonderful tool, FS, we are currently preparing a second edition, which will also be even more similar with IRC in structure. Here you have the demo page. The new team includes Alici Benchivenni, who makes the second edition possible on the platform of the Alma Mater Studiorum in Bologna. Irene Vajonakis, who has the skill and experience gained in IRC 2020 and also in Cretan Institutional Inscriptions. And Marta Fogagnolo, all three from Bologna. Muna Abdelhamid, who provided some translations into Arabic for the first edition, will add further ones to the second edition. We hope to launch this new edition next fall. You have, uh, next please. You have here the page 
of GVC six, number 60, a newcomer whose image has not been yet added, as you see, left, upper left. There is image and no image uh, yet, but it will come too. You have with FS, you, it is like having proofs while writing, and it is so useful. Now, next, please. I, will I want to mention another project, which is about squeezes. Squeezes, you see, paper prints of the inscribed first sur surface are very useful elements of our archives, as they provide a negative of the inscribed surface, light to carry away and to expose to various lights. This allows to check and improve readings, especially if the surface is in poor condition, and also to test passing dislocated fragments together, as you see right uh, now, uh, in the right image. Next, please. American scholars to the University of Florida created a software producing three dimensions images for squeezes. The French estampage project of Michel Brunet aims at preserving and sharing squeezes in open access. And it was joined already by Claudia Antonetti from Venice University, Kafoscari, in her Venice Squeeze project, with squeezes mainly from northwestern Greece. Next, please. All the metadata of the monument and the text to which the squeeze pertains are collected with a special software prepared by Eloisa Paganoni. Claudia recently projected an extension to the squeezes of Greek inscriptions from Libya. All squeezes kept in Italy, Macerata and Roma Tor Vergata, in France, from the French mission, and at the French school at Athens, made by François Chamou in the years 1960, 1950, sorry, would, should be available in open access. Hugues Berthelot is responsible for the French team. This is one further collaborative project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, I will speak briefly about three aspects of, of the next steps for inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania and the inscriptions of Roman Cyrenaica, and then also about the broader community of researchers who are interested in the epigraphy of Libya, um, and finally our proposed INSLIB platform. So the decision was taken when we published inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania and inscriptions of Roman Cyrenaica to publish them with uh, uh, ISBN numbers, uh, which was important for a publication standard, but necessarily limits what changes are then possible to make to the different platforms. <coughs> publications with ISBN numbers are fixed publications, they are frozen in time, uh, so that any changes to a digital publication with an ISBN beyond kind of very small typos or, or small errors constitutes a change to the data available to scholars who want to refer to that particular item. Um, it refers to any change in content or the addition of images, new links, that sort of thing. So for that purpose, IRT 2021 and inscriptions of Roman Cyrenaica are fixed as they are as present and they cannot be, and they can be cited for that reason as secure references. Uh, we can't make changes to them. But as we've just heard from Catherine, there are going to be new editions, second editions to inscriptions um, of Greek Cyrenaica and the Greek verse inscriptions of Cyrenaica. And it's projected that we will also be producing new um, editions of uh, IRT and IR Sire. Currently, we're in the process of putting together an editorial committee to undertake that uh, construction and digital publication of future editions. And I should stress this isn't something that we're expecting to start tomorrow, although Charlotte has been very clear with me that we mustn't dawdle. Um, and there will be tentative uh, uh, new editions in 2024, 2025, perhaps. These next editions will include these corrections uh, to the typos to errors that we didn't spot before publication. Um, we 
hope we anticipate they will uh, include new images. We've already received several new images of inscriptions for IRT 2021. Additional bibliography, unfortunately, as we were in the process of preparing IRT 2021, we were still unable to access many libraries. And so there is certainly bibliography on newly published inscriptions that we have missed and that we want to add. Um, and we're hoping, we suspect it's likely to receive modifications to our commentaries or translations of the inscriptions. And we will also want to make newly published materials accessible. So inscriptions that are being newly published in, uh, in other formats, traditional epigraphic journals, articles, catalogues, uh, we will want to include them in future editions of IRT and IR Sire. Which also gives us the opportunity to engage with the scholars who are publishing these new inscriptions um, and to help them engage with Epidoc in a meaningful way so that they're also becoming part of this bigger community. There may be the possibility of retrieving more information from the archives in Italy, particularly from Maturata, but that is something that will require um, uh, further funding investment, um, but that's also on our list. And the hope is that events, workshops such as this, will solicit information, will, will encourage uh, scholars and researchers who are working on Robe and Libya uh, to contact us with more information about all of these um, additions that we hope to make to the future editions. And with that in mind, I should also mention the potential for a digital uh, the potential for a digital publication of a really big corpus of information that is missing currently from the digital platforms, and that uh, is the Punic epigraphy of Libya. One of the contributions that I made to IRT 2021 was the addition of the Neo-Punic text to the multilingual inscriptions from uh, Tripolitania. Um, and it became clear that there are a huge number of Neo-Punic and Latino-Punic texts that we are not engaging with and which should be represented alongside uh, the corpora that we're working with. I owe a huge debt of thanks here to Professor Dr. Robert Kerr, who offered me his expertise in the most generous way possible to correct my very fledgling uh, uh, inexpert Neo-Punic. And he was extraordinarily helpful uh, and generous in, in helping us lemmatize and access, access the vocabulary and the grammatical structures of the Neo-Punic epigraphy. And in conversation with him, it has become very clear that there is the potential to develop a platform for these inscriptions. We've proven with IRT 2021 that the Epidoc conventions are suitable for dealing with the linguistic aspects of Neo-Punic texts. And we know that there's a vast corpus of material to work with. So that's also a plan for the future. Gabby, could I have the next slide, please? The second part of what's next is uh, our intention to engage more broadly with the wider community who are interested in and are already working uh, with and on Libyan epigraphy and beyond the Greek and Latin to include those workings I just mentioned, uh, uh, working on Neo-Punic texts, Latino-Punic, Libyo-Latin. So with that in mind, we will be establishing an international steering committee uh, to support the continued work on the various corpora that you've heard about uh, this afternoon and uh, to further the reach of the different platforms to those researchers who are already working on Libya. Updates to the different digital corpora will continue to be made by the individual editorial committees who are already working on them. But the International Steering Committee is intended to facilitate communication between these editorial committees, these editorial boards, and to coordinate our activities. Where there are shared interests such as geodata or shared bibliography, the Steering Committee is really aimed at, aiming at bringing that information and those activities together in a productive way. We're also hoping to include researchers and heritage and museum professionals in Libya itself to work on how we can better engage with the material that's in their inventories. Uh, and we're hoping to extend the community of digital epigraphy, as I've just mentioned, from uh, beyond the Greek and Latin texts uh, to, uh, to other languages um, that should inform our, our understanding of our own corpora. So Gabby, next slide, please. To this end, it is our proposal uh, to construct a new platform, the INSLIB platform. Its landing page does already exist. This is going to be a portal or a hub, a collaboration between King's College London, the Institute of Classical Studies, the Universities of Bologna Maturata, Paris, um, and uh, to produce a, a publication portal and search facility for the publications of 
Greek and Latin texts. It's envisioned to function as a portal through which all of the corpora we've discussed today and all future corpora uh, can be accessed, working across different digital editions to make them cross-searchable, cross-indexable, with a common bibliography and a shared geographic database. Next slide, please, Gabby. So the idea is that INSLIB as a hub will draw on existing digital platforms, but will not control them. New digital editions will continue to be made independently. INSLIB should work across different platforms to make them searchable with shared bibliography um, and, and uh, indices and geographic databases. And by bringing this information, by bringing the different corpora together in this way, it's going to completely transform the way that we look at this material. The International Steering Committee and the proposed INSLIB platform represents the most ambitious engagement with digital epigraphy yet, and it intends to bring the inscriptions together in a holistic way that makes them more accessible and more relevant to each other uh, than they have been in the past due to the way that they've been published. And it's our hope that other scholars publishing material from Libya will make use of this opportunity to present their material to and to continue these fantastic 70 years of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, thank you all. Um, the, I think one of the most exciting things about that that final um, that final point about the, the fact that this can bring um, study of you know people studying different aspects of, of Libyan antiquity, um, not only the epigraphy but, but other aspects together. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, there's there's as much connection between Cyrenaica and Egypt as there is between Cyrenaica and Tripolitania, right? Likewise, Tripolitania and, 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 and further west. So I think that that further collaboration I think is going to is going to be even more exciting. Um, so, um, so that's um, that, that, and you know, using Epidoc and using these shared mechanisms is going to is going to enable you know all sorts of other collaborations on there. So, um, so yes, um, thank you. I see I see um, some people some people already um, starting the, the applause. I think yes to all the speakers. We should we should say thank you all very much. Um, I the, just want to jump in there, Gabby, and acknowledge, because I should have done it earlier, that INSLIB is very much your brainchild and Charlotte's brainchild, and I was simply presenting it uh, to everybody else that they have had this fantastic idea for a long time, um, and it really is exciting that we're now in a position to start putting it together. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, so yes, I think we should we should move on to discussion as, as quickly as possible. Um, so um, we've already seen in the comments um, the, the the wide geographic um, range of, of our audience so far. Um, but uh, please do feel free to use the comments to make any other uh, comments or, or questions. Um, or as I say, to raise your hands um, and um, and unmute and ask and ask questions yourself. So please um, over to over to everybody else. Should we turn off the slides so we um, we can see everybody? And hopefully we can all now find our mute buttons more easily. Rosamond, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, all of you, for a wonderfully interesting set of presentations. I've just been in Vienna where I heard as it were, the next stage up with people assembling various corpuses of manuscript material. My question really relates to the exciting presentation that Alessandra gave us of potentially material that's not been looked at or edited at all yet. Is that right? That there are collections of photographs, both at the BSR and presumably elsewhere, which are not yet in the editions that Caroline and others have been talking about. May I answer this yeah. question? And uh, the photographs of the inscriptions of Roman Tripolitania cards, um, were published in the 2009 edition. So we started to collaborate at that time. Obviously there are all the photographs in the VSR archives. I guess there are all the photographs in Macerata and this is also a challenge to get those 
um, the people in Macerata involved. Uh, uh, and uh, the more, obviously, we we can um, um, we can find materials and photographs and uh, uh, associate these photographs to description or digital texts, the better, in my opinion. Uh, it is uh, uh, an effort. I have to say that uh, the publication of this first set of photographs has required a lot of work behind the scenes. The library and archive team um, have been involved in discussions about what to describe, how to describe, what kind of links we should create, and um, what things we should uh, uh, tell about a photograph which is not repetitive, because otherwise we uh, would end up uh, uh, saying the same things described in the digital edition of a text. So there are lots of questions uh, uh, and uh, preparatory work you have to go through before deciding to publish something online. But uh, obviously it's, uh, it's uh, desirable to add more photographs and to find out more archives uh, which are uh, preserving in their holdings images of inscriptions that uh, might be nowadays, and Francesca Bigi can confirm that, uh, deteriorated because of the damage uh, uh, time and weather can, uh, can do to these uh, particular objects. Uh, I hope I have answered. Indeed, your thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's a supplementary question hinging on my reference to Vienna. But one of the questions that was raised after a very long session about digitizing and finding manuscript resources was how do you make all these wonderful projects visible to people who are not necessarily specialists? If you want to know about inscriptions in Roman Tripolitania, you will find it. But what happens if you're interested in the development of monumental inscriptions from the first to the eighth century and you want to do comparative work? So I think it's a, a matter of making sure that what you're doing is also listed somewhere mm -hmm. on things which aren't necessarily specialists, that they're going to be other things, the societies of paleographers, the historians, all this kind of thing. And I think we're all going to need to make a huge effort to make sure everybody knows what you're doing and that you know what everybody else is doing because the link between the inscriptions, the epigraphic and the paleographic is something that we really still need to explore. I'm, yeah. um, I'm that I was just going to say that that's particularly apparent if you look at Tripolitania where Gabby has added all the ostraca. And actually, looking at an image of an ostracon and its script, compared to looking at some elegant uh, Roman inscription from the Forum at Lepsis, I mean, they're on the same piece of territory, but they are very, very different objects. Um, so it's, it's in some ways, it's about your principle of assembly, isn't it? Mm. And we're assembling things because they are of a particular uh, period, <laughs> and they are writing, and they're in a particular geographical area. But they do radiate out into all these other things. Am I interested in, if I'm interested in handwriting, I'll be interested in the ostraca and not in the monumental inscription. So you're right, thinking that linked data approaches to picking up those sorts of themes, that's going to have to develop and develop, I think. I think I think that, that that's absolutely right. And one of one of the things that's really important to bear in mind here is that while um, making sure people know about the work is really important, um, and making sure that the that there's um, uh, the possibility for exchange and that these things are linked to in various ways is also very important. Um, but one of the things that makes that possible um, is exactly the same thing that that made it possible for us to do this as an inscriptions of Libya, where which is actually five separate projects, um, which is using this open standard behind it. So we've talked about Epidoc as an open standard. Epidoc is itself based on TEI which is an even larger open standard, which is not only by epigraphers and papyrologists, but by a much wider um, community. Um, so pretty much any digital publication of text in the world is going to be either built on or compatible with 
TEI and therefore very closely compatible with Epidoc. So people who are working on manuscripts, people who are working on papyri, people who are working on coins, seals, brick stamps, any kind of material um, from, from the ancient world will be doing it in such a way that working with other things produced in Epidoc or TEI will, will be made so much easier on a technical level. Um, and and that, that will really lead to the sorts of things. And I think that, that's the most exciting thing about, about this, I think. Um, it's not just what the people who are interested in everything from Libya, um, but it's what the people who are interested in everything from the seventh century that mentions slaves from anywhere in the world. Right. And they and they can they can get all that stuff from us from Libya. They can get it from other people from from, you know, inscriptions from from um, from Israel and Palestine, for example, you can get it from other people for inscriptions from the rest of North Africa, from, you know, other other corpora. And, and you know, why not also a bunch of inscriptions from China from the same period and and and, and other things that, that because they use these these common standards, it becomes much more simple to, to find these things. And then once you found them, to bring them together into one place and, and to start doing things like searching them and, and, and pulling pulling that data out. Now, not all that infrastructure is there yet. I can't currently say, show me every Epidoc file that is dated to this, this century and that mentions this concept. But, but a lot of the building blocks for that are there. And we're, you know, I, I think we're quite um, future, you know, future-proofed in terms of making sure that, that that does work in the future as the infrastructure starts to, starts to build up around us. Yeah. Thanks very much. We have a question in the chat from, um, from Alan. Um, do you want to do you want to unmute and ask the question yourself, or should we read it out? Um, I can I can just read it out. I don't know who will I don't know who will answer it. Um, so the, the, the question the question was um, would it be possible? I mean, we talked about how the ISBN. Um, uh, way of thinking made it made it um, made it impossible to just continually update these things, and instead we have these um, these sort of dated, um, stable publications. And yes, would it be possible to have um, you know a public version of the the non um, version, the non static version of of something like IRT um, that is just updated whenever we learn more or whenever we have time to update it, because not everybody you know is is, is working on this full time. But you know maybe you know every now and again. Um, you know, we'd, we'd add a bunch of files. I mean, there, there is there is such a version um, that is gradually being updated, and one day will become IRT twenty twenty four or whatever whatever we've um, decided to call it. But um, but that's not public. That's that's an in progress thing that the editors are looking at. The the question, I guess, is would it be possible? And I can see why a lot of people would find this desirable, right? To have that be a public, um, you know, non static um, uh, pu public publication. I think. But can I jump in there? Because I'm responsible for putting these dates in the URL. It was I who decided ALA 2004, INSAF, IF 2007. I've put the date of publication into the URL to make it absolutely fixed and clear. And it's almost all about citation. Um, because humanists are not terribly happy doing this consulted on such and such a date kind of convention. And I think it's quite important for people to be able to see, well, the reason so-and-so didn't mention such and such a thing is because it wasn't in the 2020 edition. It was published later than that. It's important that citations should be, that people should feel very, very secure when they're citing something. And that's my, but it may well be, I think, this is my rather old fashioned paper based way of thinking, because I've spent so much of my life trying to sell digital publications to conventional scholars. I think it may be that as people become more comfortable in the digital environment, that the continuing, that the, 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 the cumulative approach uh, will become easier to handle. But one has to think about it very, very carefully. There's adding a new inscription but there's also tweaking a bit of an inscription. You've got to make awfully sure that everything is very clearly documented and that people know how to access that documentation. I think this, this could got to be there that this is not instead of the, the static yeah. versions. Yes. Um, I mean, there, there are models with, with of these things that are updated um, continuously, like, like papyri.info, for example, where the, the whole do, do, do data bank, if I want to make a change to, to a reading of a papyrus or a translation of a papyrus, um, it will be available the next day. 
um, or as soon as an editor has looked at it and said it's okay, you know, it'll be available very, very quickly. And so, so, and, and you know, when you get the current edition of a particular papyrus or ostracon in that interface, there is at the bottom a list of all the changes that have ever been made and on what date. And um, so you can see, you know, so and so who who cited this, you know, in in their 2021 publication had only seen changes up to this point. So you, you can do that and people are used to that. People are now, um, as, as, as grumpy as scholars can still be about it, people are now used to using Wikipedia and we know that's updated all the time. And if we really want to, we can find out what the version of Wikipedia that was last updated, um, you know, on the date it was cited was and so forth. So, um, you know, that that's, 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 it's, yeah, I think, I think it, it's, we're getting closer to that being a, yes. an acceptable yeah. and, you know, a way of, yeah. way of doing this. Um, Philip had his hand raised and then put it down again. Um, I don't know if you gave up on the question or? Uh, I'll, I'll come back, but basically I think you've covered the, the, the ground that I was concerned about. Um, I wonder whether we need to move more towards uh, the kind of thing that we see with software, um, version 10.3.37. Um, and that needs somehow to be visible on every page because one's going to want to cite an individual document uh, and you really will want to know uh, exactly which version of that page you're citing. Um, and of course, the other thing is that we are all increasingly familiar with is that error 404. This page is no longer where you're looking for it. Um, I, I don't know any way around that. That's clearly a, a sort of universal um, issue with, with digital data nowadays. Well, part of the answer to that is, is internet archives, I think. So if a page disappears, the internet archive probably still knows about it. Um, you have to know to look for it there, but, um, but, but th there ought to be a way. And I think this is probably becoming more of a thing where you know, your browser will, if you try to visit a page, it doesn't, it just will automatically try and look in the internet archive for you to see if the, if the page used to exist and you're just looking for something that's inside. So that sort of thing might be partially answered. I think the software versioning I'm thinking is a very neat way of thinking about this and actually is in danger of, of convincing Charlotte because Charlotte <laughs> often refers to software as an example for how we need to, to deal with authorship. Because you know, when you when you have software that takes a long time to load, very, very quick to load software like Microsoft Word, you don't notice this on, but long, slow software like something like Photoshop, when it comes up with the loading screen, it says authored by and then lists like yes. 200 people. And Charlotte yeah. wants that to be on the front page of all our epic corporate, mm. our epigraphic corporate, which you're quite rightly. So I, th I think you're thinking in terms of, you know, this is not not IRT 2021 followed by IRT 2025, but you know, this is IRT, you know, for version 6.17, you know, and, and that does yeah. give you. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is quite neat. There is one dreary point to raise. It's easier to get funded for a limited and fixed project. And mm -hmm. the, the ongoing projects, which we would like to see, uh, we do have to work out what business model is. But then I would say with the whole of digital publication, the business model is still developing, uh, right. evolving. Um, and it's going to be very different in five years' time, I think. I mean, it, it's happening so fast now. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you. Maria? Hello. Thank you. That was a really, well, lots of really interesting talks there. Uh, I'm really interested in the uh, IRT version, uh, especially, but all of them, of course. Is there a way for uh, people to follow the progress that you're making? I don't know, for example, if you have an email list or if there are regular monthly meetings or anything like that, uh, just keep us up to date. Because I wasn't even aware, for example, about this uh, until I just saw it by chance. And I use IRT quite a lot. So it would be really interesting to know what uh, updates are being made and how we can help, obviously, of course, with the project and anything like that. So uh, do you have anything for us, for people to keep up to date with what you're doing? Not as yet, Maria, but we will be. And that's something that I've been speaking to a couple of people about um, in the last week or so, about how we kind of create a, a, a hub through which we can communicate with all interested parties um, in, in a very kind of joined up and speedy way. Um, so yes, I will note your particular interest 
um, now, but uh, there will be a way that we can uh, we can reach all interested parties simultaneously with new updates and new information. Thank you, Caroline. I'll drop you an email. <laughs> yes, please do. Please do. Yeah, that's a challenging question, isn't it? Because on the one hand, um, you know, having having a mailing list or having a page that people can visit that has this information on or whatever would be very neat. But on the other hand, we'd only catch people who know knew in advance that that's what they were interested in who've signed up, which will be a relatively small number of people. And you know, the, the, all the other people, the people who are at this this workshop, is them learning about this this work for the first time. Those are the people we really want to reach. And you know, what, what do we do? We scatter shot all the mailing lists and social media that we can between us, and, and that and that works. But so so some combination of both, I think, is is going to be important. Um, but also. We, we will want to make it clear that this hub and this group of people who are interested in this steering committee and these various different sort of bodies of people who are working on this are a different thing from the publication itself. So we, we won't just go to the internet page, which is where you get the corpora. That shouldn't be the same page you go to to get all of the discussion and, and here's how you sign up to find out more. It should be easy to find one from the other, but they're not quite the same thing. They maybe have slightly different names. And, you know, so there's a, a lot of very, very sort of interesting um, sort of questions to, to, to play with there. I think one, one thing that I think is that uh, I've often thought about publishers, uh, conventional publishers, the big question is what do they actually do? Um, they certainly don't proofread anymore, but the, uh, the, they do charge a lot of money, but there is one crucial service that they perform and that is selling. And they publicize, and what I've found with all our digital publications, is that actually getting people to know that they're there is not trivial. It's really quite difficult to do. And especially it may go on, out only to a digital world, but not to the other. And the real missing ingredient is that so far, nothing that I have published online has been reviewed. So that's the way conventionally that scholars have discovered about things. Uh, and that just seems there's a there's a big space there, and I don't know what the answer is. Library catalogues and making sure it's mentioned in people's teaching, you know, get, exactly. get it, where people find things for the first time, you know. Um, but yeah. getting it in there, just yes, getting yes, it in, yes, is just yes. not it's not that obvious how to do it. Yeah. Write a paper article about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's probably yes, that's probably right. <laughs> Um, apropos uh, of that issue, um, how does anybody find that digital work that they do nowadays affects their, their REF scores, their university ratings? Um, because again, this is a changing world. And while we all hate uh, the uh, scores that are based on simple paper publications. This is a whole further area of activity which is entirely valid and needs somehow to be um, evaluated. Someone said to me when I started on all of this, it's all right for you to do this because you're old. <laughs> which is, in fact, absolutely true. Yes. There's, yes. There's, there's, um, there's also a I risk simple... nothing by doing mm. it. Now, there's, I mean, a, sim a, sim a simple, maybe slightly simplistic answer is that um, the actual ref committees, and this is, sorry, this is very UK centric, but for the rest of the world, this is, this is, you know, the, the, the committees who assess academic work across, um, across the UK university sector, and it has an impact, not, not the massive impact that it used to, but it does have an impact on the funding that universities get in the, in the longer term, so it's really important. The, the, the ref committees recognize digital work just as much as they do print work they have no they have no you know it has no disadvantage there um hiring panels and promotion committees don't always catch up and aren't always as aware of that as the as the ref committees are so it can be a little bit harder to, to sort of get it you know down down the pipeline and, and other people i mean I'm, I'm quite lucky my university doesn't submit to ref but um other people whose universities do might have more more to add to that I mean, the other way in which I think, Caroline, you mentioned that to me recently, that um, that the ref and the other kind of assessment things can be met by these things is by um, looking at impact, 
case studies and looking at um, you know outreach and looking at public engagement and other things that are considered valuable academic activity that the digital things kind of do even better and in addition to their uh, the traditional publication yeah i mean i I'm loath to get into a discussion of impact case studies at, at the end of what's been such a nice uh, workshop, but uh, the certainly the accessibility of digital projects, I think, has been has been proven to be very successful in consideration of impact case studies, and um, because of the reach, the the, the potential. Um, increase in in, in in measurable in meaningful measurable impact that one can make um by reaching a broader audience um and certainly uh you know we're dealing with very particular material in in terms of inslib but um as a sort of broader proposal more generally digital projects and certainly um they're very positively received amongst research officers um uh, at the moment but yeah, I think it is very important to convince the the decision makers, the 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 the, administ you know, the administration of our, our various institutions, that that these digital publications are publications. Um, and I think you know we all need to get into the habit of unapologetically in your CV where where it says books, put your digital publications right there. Don't have a separate section for digital publications because that that invites people to ignore them. Um, Absolutely, that sort of things important. As you know, I always say to everyone, never refer to your web publication as a web page. Always refer to it as a study or a biography or a corpus or a, a, a what it is intellectually rather than how it's delivered. Yeah. Yeah. And use it in one's teaching because once the students start demanding uh, you know, more information from these projects and more, more um, more further additions of them, then, then we really know that we've created something that um, that has uh, the student money factor behind it, if nothing else, which uh, is uh, useful for future grant applications. And as Francesca says, this doesn't preclude doing things on paper as well, and overlapping, you know, and, and having you know print articles, um, you know, that 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 contain some of the same content um, that that are. You know that are that are accessible to a slightly different audience, and that we recognised in that way. And as soon as someone prepares the two, they will immediately see how inadequate the paper is in comparison, because you can't search it, you can't filter it, you can't reorganise it on the page. You know, you can't Can I it. say something, <clears throat> please. Personally, I'm very much in favour of the um, open uh, repository. Uh, thinking how it's done in EDR, the Epigraphic Database Rome, uh, in which compilers put in all description based on a CIL reading. And when they put it in, they check it. And if it's some, something that they disagree on or mistake or something, they just noted that there is a, an editor's string. Um, so they are doing some editing. They are, in a way, publicating something. <laughs> Uh, but without the use of paper, and it's immediately there, and it's constantly updated, checked, and corrected. So I would love the IIT to become something like that, uh, that you can also do without the paper publication and publish it straight out onto the IIT. If it gets an IIT number, it's a publication. You don't need to print it before it goes digital. But I, I know Charlotte doesn't agree with that, but I, I'm for it completely. <laughs> yeah, that, I'm only that's, thinking that's... about people's careers. I think at the moment, I think what I would, I think we should present all these projects as creating a repository corpus for the inscriptions of Libya. But for the time being, not the first place where something is published because that some, way you get two publications i've got two publications here's my article in some obscure journal which nobody will ever see and here is my contribution to the online corpus which has been accepted as coming from me it so i get two publications out of one thing and i think for people's careers in the shorter term that's the safest model for some people that'll be true i think for some people um, putting, putting something straight into, I mean, is it really much more prestigious to have a, you know, one and a half page article in ZPE than it is to have a, a an inscription in, in IRT? In it depends on the age of the it, tenure it does, committee. It does, it does a little bit, but, but 
you know, for some people, for some people, and it may not, may not always be. Hmm. Um, and I think we do have also the concept of the micro publication yeah. that is considering increasingly important. And again, it doesn't preclude, um, you know, doing something else with it as well. Um, but you know, the, 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 the micro publication, the thing that you can, you know, that the, on, one of them alone on your CV doesn't, doesn't really make a lot, you know, isn't, isn't really that useful. If I said, I've, you know, I've tweaked one papyrus in papyri.info wouldn't be a particularly useful thing for me to, to list. But the fact that I've tweaked 90 different papyri on, on papyri.info, um, you know, starts to look like something, something relatively meaningful. Yeah. Um, even if some of them are fairly small tweaks and then they're, you know, technical rather than, rather than papyrological in some cases, in some cases they're translations, in other cases they are, you know, new, new papyrological readings that starts to add up to a thing and micro publications in of scale can be useful but they can also be very useful um the you know for students for example if you have students contributing to something mm -hmm. even if all students are doing is adding a translation of a latin text um and it's it's been checked by their tutor before it before it went up that in itself is a micro publication it's worth them putting on their cv they might, might not put it on there anymore once they're a postdoc but you know while they're an undergraduate having said i translated 32 texts in this corpus is something that that is relevant to them so my micro publications at various different levels and at various different scales um, you know, can also be a model by which these things go in. And this, this might be a person who, you know, who's not interested in having an article in ZPA or, you know, that their contribution is, is something that's too small to be, to be, um, you know, to be that sort of publication. Yeah. And those things are, are also, you know, a useful way to, to contribute to this. And I think I, I would like, um, I think as, um, you know, as both Francesca and, and Philip have, have, have argued to, to have something that is, um, you know, is contributable to at all sorts of scales and in, you know by all sorts of people um, in in the longer term. And it may not be that the only thing that comes that comes out of this um, this corpus in this community. And it may not be the final um, you know stable publication, but it's some, something that's there as well that people contribute to. I think I think is valuable for a lot in a lot of ways. Um, um, uh, Robert, sorry, you're still muted. Yes, thank you. Uh, Great. It's all been very interesting, Great but I uh, nice to see uh, Charlotte and Wilson uh, and, and Caroline. And uh, but just with the so one thing I don't understand about what Charlotte said is the business model because I mean with the book you sell it, so with the financing, but that goes beyond me. But I was just thinking with the publication thing there. One of the things that I used a lot before. Uh, IRT 2021 was uh, the Epigraphic Datenbank Klaus Slaby. And they continually update. And I've also noticed uh, they also have a peer reviewed journal, the ECDS journal. And wouldn't that be something to think of, you know, to an IRT or a Libyan journal, i.e., where in IRT, itself as Carolyn envisaged it. <clears throat> you just put a reference to a new peer reviewed article, which just happens to be uh, in the um, IRT journal, let us say. I.e. that we add a journal to the IRT platform and there we can add discussions. And we don't have to overload the um, because one of the advantages I think, or one of the nice things about IRT 2021, there is some commentary, but it's not overloaded. But it does the bibliography where if you're really interested in what this letter might be, you can go and look at uh, 50 articles where they're still arguing about it. I think that's very important. I, I, I think actually I'm extremely keen to stick to that principle of not overloading, because also what we're presenting, which, which EDCS doesn't present, is a full account of the stone and its text, the fullest possible account of everything you can say about that stone. But, and that won't date. It might be improved, somebody might come along and measure it again or something like that, but on the whole, those, those are real data. Discussions, or something else. They, they, are, they are a process of conversation, which is going to go on. And the, the corpus, I'm coming increasingly to think this, 
that the corpus where you present the texts is not the place to have the conversation, but you're right that you then want to say, where does the conversation go? And I was involved in, a, in another, thinking about a different project, about this idea, of will these corpora almost inevitably produce associated discussion areas? Now, that may be the case. On the other hand, you could say it would be better to put that discussion into a journal where a wider range of people might see it. That's the other side of that coin. That if you want to discuss number 231, you put that discussion in Libyan studies or in the Journal of Roman studies or whatever else. And that way, a, a larger number, a, a wider a, people with wider interests will see it. So I think it's, it's, it's a balanced thing. Yeah. If I could just add a comment to that, because what, what Francesca was saying is with write a paper article, it's, I mean, it's good, but to talk about the exposure on the internet for a publication like IRT 2021, which costs a lot of money, apparently, I think, with to get the financing. Um, if you had an online journal, because, I mean, we're working mm -hmm. in the field anyway, so the amount of effort is minimal compared to starting something up ex ovo and then people would soon realize that this is the place to be <laughs> for discussing yeah. these texts and when just picking yeah. up on, on costs i think that the thing about the costs is that the money we had to put into this was no more than the su subsidy we would have had to well i can't imagine the subsidy we'd have had to give to a publisher to publish those photographs Exactly, yeah. I mean, we've all had that conversation with the publisher. Yeah. Um, and he then, having taken your money, produces very low quality photographs and then charges people a whopping price as well. So it's, it's the images that remain one of the core things. So the costs are no worse, are no worse than that. But they, they are costs and they have to be met somehow. That's why, Nobody, that's why the business model has some existence. No, it's just to get as much um, to con as much concentration yep. for Libya on one site, and then people will, in time, see that if you uh, are doing something Libyan, that's the place have, to go. Yeah, yeah. I think one one thing, uh, possibly a, a short, a, a small but a manageable uh, way of, of, of sort of thinking about these is, is that should should this inscriptions of Libya steering committee or whatever they um, call themselves um, also one of the things they do is is provide peer review because that's that's what we're talking mm. about um, and that's um, and that's that's something that, that needs to be thought about and what would that mean um, that's that's quite um, that's quite cool and in combination with I mean that's the, the important thing about micro publications is that they're peer reviewed in some way so they are they are real publications you know it's you know all my contributions to Wikipedia over the years are, are not micro publications because no one's peer reviewed them I guess you know by virtue of them not having been deleted uh, yet <laughs> they, they, they sort of are but 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 you know they're not, they're not in the same way so they're not on my CV but um, but you know my contributions to Paradox.info are because they're peer reviewed and so so that sort of thing I think is. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly something for us to think about. Yeah. Can I just uh, say on the theme of collaboration that it's a particular pleasure to meet Robert because he, of all the people we've collaborated with, he's the only person we never met. We had no personal connection at all. Um, and it was great to have, and Caroline and I have benefited enormously, but it was great to have some, as you might say, a stranger who was prepared to join the family. And I think I hope we can continue that spirit of there are people out there who've got stuff they could tell us, who've got that photograph of the otherwise unphotographed stone, who know what it says on the back, that sort of thing. There are people out there and making them feel welcome is going to be very, very important. As you're over, over to Caroline, over to Caroline and Katrine to make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, good. I, I think um, I was I was about to say that we're, we've run out of time and we're also starting to address questions that are much bigger than us. But actually, we've now come full circle and we're now addressing questions that we can answer, um, which is how how we're going to do this. And I think both both Caroline and Kathleen have given us a very good 
um, sense of, of, of what needs to happen next. And I think most most of us will will continue to be in that conversation. So I, I, I look forward to that. So um, I just thank and ask you all to thank the um, the speakers all very much again. And, uh, and thank you all. Thank you all for, for, for joining and for your contributions.